Good morning, my name's Steve. I want to give you uh, a really warm welcome to King Church Birmingham um, as we meet online. Um, a huge uh, greeting to the King Church family. Uh, it's really good to be together. I know you know it's not quite the same, not all the same as meeting in person, but at least we can connect in this way. So I'm glad you're here and we're able to do that. Um, but I can bring you a a greeting uh, through the wonderful uh, means of Mon technology, almost like from my home to your home. Uh, it's so good to be together. And I also want to greet you if you're new, if you're looking in, and uh, whether, you know, so especially if you don't go to church um, ordinarily, but are kind of checking this out in this kind of strange season. We're so glad that you're here and able to watch. And if you'd like any more information, do uh, email us at hello at kingchurchbirmingham.org or send us a message through our social media channels. Uh, we'd love to say hello and to connect you or at least give you some more information about what is going on. So it's good, good to be together. We're going to do things uh, slightly differently to what we've done over the last couple of weeks. Um, the first two times we've done this, I was able to do a message and then we connected uh, on Zoom in our different groups afterwards. But we thought it was important to have an element of worship in our meeting. So Anna is going to lead us uh, briefly in a worship time. And uh, I know even that is not going to be everything because we really value things like contributions and people using what the Bible calls spiritual gifts. And we're going to look at other contexts where we might be able to have that at prayer meetings I'll share about a bit later. Um, but we, we just wanted to have something, some element of worship where we can sing together, we can engage with God, give him all the glory. So I'm going to hand over to Anna and that's how we're going to begin. Hello, everybody. Um... It's so great to be worshipping together. It's a real privilege. Um, playing the piano is not my strong point, so don't listen too carefully, but I'm really excited that we get to come and gather around the throne of God together and worship together. And then I'm just going to start by reading some words from Psalm 33, and then we'll sing. Um, so it says this, The Lord merely spoke, and the heavens were created. He breathed the word and all the stars were born. He assigned the sea its boundaries and locked the oceans in vast reservoirs. Let the whole world fear the Lord and let everyone stand in awe of him. For when he spoke, the world began. It appeared at his command. And then it goes on to say, don't count on your war horse to give you victory. For all its strength, it cannot save you. But the Lord watches over those who fear him, those who rely on his unfailing love. He rescues them from death and keeps them alive in times of famine. We put our hope in the Lord. He is our help and our shield. In him, our hearts rejoice, for we trust in his holy name. Let your unfailing love surround us, Lord for our hope is in you alone. And I've just been so encouraged recently, um, just thinking that my war horse can't save me, all the things that I might put my hope in, that I might put my trust in, they can't save me, lots of them have been taken away, so much of life has been stripped there, but the Lord is the one who is my help and my shield. And although the things that I might put my trust in can't save me, he can and he will. He's my rescuer and in him my heart rejoices. So we're going to trust in his holy name and we're going to ask that the unfailing love of the Lord would surround us. We're going to put our hope in him alone. We're going to celebrate that he is good, that he is God, that he's with us. And if he's with us, then everything's going to be okay. <clears throat> so we're going to start by singing, Here for you, let our praise be your welcome. Let our praise be your welcome. Let our songs be sung. We are here for you. We are here for you. Let 
your breath come from heaven fill our hearts with your light we are here for you we are here for you to you our hearts are open nothing here is hidden you are our
It's a joy that we can uh, experience the presence of God wherever we are, um, even in, in the privacy of our own homes. God is with us. Um, we honour God for who he is. 
it's great to worship. Uh, I also have a few notices. Uh, I know that you know no church meeting, even online, would be complete would be complete without uh, a few notices. Um, and so the first one is just to say. On Wednesday, uh, the 8th of April, we're going to have a prayer meeting online. Uh, we're going to meet on Zoom uh, and the details will be published about that. But I just think it's so important that we're able to gather on Zoom. We'll be able to see each other's faces, which I think will be fun. Um, but I guess especially to, to pray for ourselves and for our church, that we would stay strong, we'd go deeper in God together. And also in this time to pray for our nation, that I do believe this is... Uh, an opportunity for God to come in a new way. I'm personally praying for revival, that God uh, will move uh, across our lands. Uh, so it'd be so good to pray together, to pray into that, to seek Him. Uh, it probably won't be as long as a, as a normal prayer meeting as we get used to how uh, the technology like Zoom works. But why not come and gather? Uh, this Wednesday, we won't have life groups. We want to prioritize praying together. So Wednesday, 8 p.m. Uh, look forward to seeing you there. Secondly, uh, next uh, Easter weekend uh, is coming up and um, we have a real privilege that we get to have a Good Friday meeting as well as an Easter Sunday meeting, uh, which for King Church is especially uh, joyful because ordinarily we don't meet in the school over Easter, we have a break, but through the, the means of doing things online, we get to have two meetings over Easter, Good Friday, I'm going to preach, we'll have some worship as well, and then Easter Sunday, Tim Suffield will be bringing a message, also some worship. Uh, two wonderful opportunities to praise God and to hear from His Word. And I also want to um, ask you to consider inviting someone to it, which I know is a slightly a uh, strange way of thinking about it and uh, I you know, not really thought much before this about inviting someone online but if you have a friend or a family member who you think I think they would actually be interested in this and in these unusual times if people are looking for hope and for, for different answers uh, why not share uh, our meeting online we're going to put a post up which you can share you can click maybe kind of send to someone you know um, that if you think they'd be interested, that they might be blessed uh, by it in these times, then we'd, it's kind of an easy invite. Um, so have a think about if there's someone you know who you could connect uh, in in that way. And then finally, I want to say a huge thank you to everyone who's part of the church who gives regularly through standing orders or other ways. Uh, thank you for your generosity and your faithfulness. Um, I also wanted to just... Uh, give an invitation to those that maybe signed up um, across our pledge Sundays to give something. If you haven't had a chance to begin or to fulfill that, uh, would you uh, do so if you're able? And also, if uh, also if you're able to do uh, in this in this season uh, to to give a gift to help someone who may be struggling financially or in hardship. We're looking to have a little pile of fund where we can bless and look after one another. So if you mark a gift specifically for that, we will make sure it goes where it needs to go. Uh, so do have a pray. Uh, and if you're listening in, uh, not part of the church, just want to say this really is for, for our members in terms of the regular giving you know, under no obligation. But if you would like to give something, all our details are on our website, kingchurchbirmingham.org. And if you mark what your gift's for, we'll ensure it goes where it needs to go. So thank you for your generosity uh, and God bless you. And now I'm going to hand over to Tim, uh, who's going to bring the word of God to us. Good morning, King's Church. It's great to be with you. Uh, welcome to my living room. Uh, it's Palm Sunday today, as many of you will know, when we celebrate and remember Jesus entering into Jerusalem at the start of the last week of his life, leading up to the climactic events uh, of Good Friday and Easter Sunday that we'll be able to celebrate together, albeit virtually next weekend. So this morning I'm going to be preaching from Luke chapter 19. If you've got a Bible with you, uh, do you want to grab it and then turn to Luke chapter 19 uh, and I'm going to read from verse 28. And when he had said these things, this is Jesus, he went on ahead going up to Jerusalem. And when he drew near to Bethphage and Bethany at the mount that is called Oliviet, he sent two of the disciples saying, go into the village in front of you, where on entering you will find a colt tied, that's like a, a young donkey, on which no one has ever yet sat. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, why are you untying it? 
you shall say this, the Lord has need of it. So those who were sent away, uh, those who were sent, excuse me, went away and found it just as he had told them. And as they were untying the colt, its owner said to them, why are you untying the colt? Obvious question. And they said, the Lord has need of it. And the owners seemed to say nothing more. And they brought it to Jesus and throwing their cloaks on the colt, they set Jesus on it. And as he rode along, they spread their cloaks on the road. And as he was drawing near, already on the way down to the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of his disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works that they had seen, saying, Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. And some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to him, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. He answered, I tell you, if these were silent, the very stones would cry out. So Jesus is uh, entering into Jerusalem at the start of the last week of his life. We'll get into what happens with the disciples and the crowds and things that they say about him and what, that's, what that tells us about him uh, in a few moments. Before we do, I am utterly fascinated by this donkey, this cult. Because it, 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 it seems in the face of it to be a very strange request. Jesus says the two of his disciples head into that village up ahead and they're thinking, oh, he's going to ask us to go and get some food or some drink or, or, or something that you'd obviously be able to find in any village. And he says, when you get in there, just on the left, you'll find this young donkey tied up. And they think, strange knowledge for Jesus to have. Wonder how he knows that. And then take it. And if the owners come and ask, well, why are you taking our donkey? Say the Lord has need of it. As though that would be enough. I am really impressed by the disciples' faith, by the fact that they are happy to take what appears to be a crazy instruction on face value and think, sure, yeah, I'm quite happy to do that. I can do that. We can go and say those things and of course that'll be okay. And when you're reading it in the Bible, it, it sort of sounds normal and then you transpose that into something that we might encounter in our everyday life and is revealed to be very strange. Imagine I looked out of my windows over there and I saw, I can see my car on the driveway and I saw a group of people gathered around it. Yeah, and they seemed to be kind of looking at my car and trying to get into it. And I went outside and said, well, what are you doing? And they said, oh, no, no, it's okay. The Lord has need of it. I don't think my first response would be to say, yeah, of course, that's fine. Off you go. I think I'd phone the police. And so I find that I am challenged by both the disciples who are willing to take Jesus on face value. I don't know if I would. And also by the donkey owner. In some ways, I think the hero of this particular story beyond Jesus is, is the donkey owner who is so generous, who, who says, of course, the Lord has need of it. Of course you can have it. Do I do the same thing? If the Lord has, something, has need of something of, of mine or need of me or need of others in my home or my household, is my response, of course you can have it. I don't know that I'm that generous. And I find myself challenged by that. And I, and I think that we should be challenged to think, are we that generous? Would we fear God in that way to say, yes, of course, God can have everything that is mine. And then as we dig a little bit into the context to find out why were the donkey owners so up for just saying, yes, that's fine. I, I find that there's a, a tradition in the ancient Near East where kings and religious teachers, of course, Jesus was both, uh, were able to go and take anyone's food or animal and borrow it for a time if they had need of it, as long as they then returned it. So perhaps less strange that a donkey owner said yes, but they are recognising something about Jesus and making a statement about him when they do so. And, and I start to wonder, what does that mean about things that I might have that God might ask? Does he have the same rights over my things? Or am I safe because there's no law that says that he can take anything of mine? And yet, of course... We learn in our Bibles and in our hearts as we engage with God that he 
owns everything. It's a cattle on a thousand hills, the psalmist says. But everything that we have comes first from him. Every good gift comes from the Father of lights, says John. And so therefore, all of my things actually belong to him first. So not only are the donkey owners being generous, they're also recognising Jesus' right to request it. Do I do the same thing? Am I as generous with what I have as those donkey owners were? And I think that should challenge us to think, how can we respond to God's requests on our lives with generosity, particularly right now? in this strange period that we find ourselves in, where we are largely stuck in our homes, what does generosity look like? And how then can we do it? This is one of the things that um, you're gonna be discussing in your life groups on Zoom once we've finished with the kind of online uh, section of this morning, uh, the video section, excuse me, of this morning. But just to kind of prompt you a little bit, what, uh, how can we respond with generosity to others in the church? What could you do right now to bless someone else in the church? How this week could you plot and plan to show honour to someone else within the life of King's Church, especially those who are particularly vulnerable or particularly lonely or finding this particularly challenging or whose work has gotten particularly difficult, uh, whether because there isn't any or there's so much of it because of this current period that we find ourselves in? How could you do that? I bet you there are loads of ways that we can bless one another and it would do God honour if we used the things that he has given us to show honour to each other. What could you do in your neighbourhood? How could you begin to show hospitality perhaps to your neighbours despite the fact you can't get within two metres of them and they can't get in your house? How can you reach out to them even though you can't actually reach out to them? I think there's lots of different things we can do. There was a great video by Dave and Helen Eckley that we posted, uh, I think it was on Thursday. Check that out. They had lots of ideas about what they could do with some of their neighbours, how they could show hospitality at the moment. Um, and I think last week, Chloe did a video uh, about sort of how we reach out to our neighbours, how we show that we love them and how we can present the gospel to them through practical means in this particular crisis. I'd really encourage you to think what you can do. How can you make sure that your street experiences the love of God because there's someone full of the generosity like those donkey owners who say, of course, God can have what is mine. And perhaps most relevant at the moment, how can God have your time and how can you be generous with it? Are you ensuring that you give him time in your day? We, we live in these uh, weird period where we have both lots of time and very little time, and we don't know what the time is. We're not quite sure what day of the week it is. I mean, I'm not recording this on Sunday, and yet it's Sunday right now. Time is all over the place. And we both have more time and less time. Uh, probably that's true for all of us, though we're particularly experiencing one or the other right now. Uh, how can we make sure that we are giving God our time? How can we be generous? with our time towards him, what can we do? We need to think on these things and think carefully about them. The other thing that the donkey reveals to us is Jesus' strange and total knowledge of events. Now, of course, Jesus knows everything. This is God in human flesh, fully God, fully man, knowledgeable about the world, the one who keeps the galaxy spinning while he's trudging along the Jerusalem road. But he knows everything including the location of a young donkey, not information that maybe I would expect him to have. He is not surprised. He needs transportation into Jerusalem and he needs transportation that says things about him. So he wants a donkey for reasons we'll come back to in a moment. But he has total knowledge of events so that he sends a couple of his disciples off to say, go and get that donkey. Now that, while most of the time, is, is a sort of side comment just about, okay, that's who he is, he's God, he can do that. I find that so encouraging right now because it means that COVID-19 has not surprised Jesus. He had total knowledge of what was going to happen and how it was going to play out. And he is the God who consistently in the Bible turns evil for good. He is the God who seven days after this having in five days time been brutally murdered, would walk out of the grave. The one who always turns evil for good. 
So we can take comfort knowing that even when we don't understand events, even when we perhaps could try and predict what might happen in the future, but we don't know. Our certainty has clearly been shattered. Our ability to predict has clearly been uh, destroyed. We know that God knows that he is in control, that he has total knowledge and skill and power to turn all evil events, and these are evil days that we live in, but to turn all evil events to good and to the saving of many lives. And then Jesus arrives in Jerusalem and he is welcomed by the crowd in a scene, I suppose, reminiscent of when uh, a football team arrives back from their uh, successful um, World Cup. Uh, you can tell I don't know very much about football and I'm struggling with this, but when they come back in the buses, they've won something and they come back in the buses uh, and then people will lie in the streets and wave at them because we like them. Um, it, it, that sort of moment where people are coming out alone in the streets and they're like, oh, there's a bit of a celebrity here and they're, they're making a lot of noise. Or perhaps think back to last Thursday when you may have heard, and indeed the Thursday before, heard lots and lots of noise outside your house at eight o'clock. We certainly did both times. Our street starts to make noise and clap and, and bang pans for the clap for our carers um, moment that we seem to be having each Thursday, a kind of moment of, of collective joy, I suppose, in the self-sacrifice of others on our behalf. Um, the whole street was out. Um, last week, Helen went out and took a bow uh, for her work at the moment, which is challenging, as I'm sure you can imagine. Um, but it, that sort of moment when everyone is coming out and they are politely applauding in a very British way, um, or perhaps in the ancient Near East in Jerusalem, waving palm branches and shouting, Hosanna, come and save us, mighty king. A little bit like that. And then imagine if, if a number of doctors and nurses walked down the street and the, the applause would get louder and louder and we'd be, I mean, very British and kind of contained about it, but we'd be very excited. It's that kind of moment as Jesus enters into Jerusalem. And much like with the two disciples who went to get the donkey and the donkey owner, as Jesus enters in again, we find that people's hearts are revealed. There are three groups of people that we encountered, two of them in this passage in Luke uh, and the other one more clearly in um, the equivalent accounts in Mark and Matthew and John. But firstly, there are the disciples. And in verse 38, we see exactly who, what they say about Jesus. They gather around him. They lay their cloaks on the ground to make a mat for him to walk on so that the dust of the earth will not attach to him. And they say, blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. That's who they're saying Jesus is. He's a king who comes in the name of God and he will therefore be blessed. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. So they declare that this is a moment, this king coming in is a moment that means the warfare between earth and heaven will be ended and this king will be shown and seen to be wonderful and glorious to all of the earth. They are making a mighty declaration about who he is. And so what we see revealed is their hearts, that they know who he is, that they want to worship him as a king, that they are delighted by him and want to declare that to everyone. That is a good reaction, friends. Would that it were ours, that we would see Jesus enter in perhaps to our lives and then say, wow, this is the king. I want to devote everything to him. And then the second group of people, the crowds. Now, in Luke's account, he, he mixes kind of the crowds and the disciples together. He makes it sound like everyone there was disciples. And I think that's because he wants us to particularly focus on their response. We see in some of the other uh, gospel accounts that there were clearly there was a wider crowd. John talks about uh, the crowd who'd heard that Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead just a couple of weeks before, and they're still curious about it. Some of them saw that event, others heard about it from people who'd seen it, and they're like, this is the man who raises the dead. I really want to know him. I really want to know, or perhaps not so much to know him as I want to know what's going on. I'm really curious about him. He seems like an interesting guy. And they come out of curiosity and out of interest, and they want to find out what's going on and what's happening. And they treat him like a great king of the surrounding nations, a great king of a Greek or Roman nation. They uh, use shouts like Hosanna. Luke doesn't record it, we hear it in the other Gospels, which means please come and save us or be our salvation, but would commonly be used for entering warrior kings. They are expecting a resplendent warrior king on a great charger 
coming to rescue them politically from Roman oppression. That's what many of these people have been longing for, coming to rescue them from Roman oppression. And yet what they get, so they're keen on the king, they're kind of interested in who Jesus is, and yet what they receive is something slightly different. Because this is a king coming on a donkey, which is a sign of peace, an Old Testament prediction that the Messiah, the mighty king, would come on a donkey because his reign would be one of peace. So this is a king coming to bring them peace, but not with a sword, but with peace itself, which is what happened. Jesus defeated much greater powers than the Romans, the powers of sin and death and hell, by himself dying in our place. And so what we see in the crowds that their expectations are confounded and what they were looking for and longing for in their hearts, which are revealed by his presence, was Jesus to meet their desires rather than Jesus to be their master. So we see disciples want Jesus to be their master. Crowds interested in Jesus want him to meet their desires. And then the third group, the Pharisees, we read about in verse 39. These were a particularly strict religious group who were very popular in Israel at the time. And it says, And some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to him, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. They're talking to Jesus. Rebuke your disciples because of what they're saying about him. And Jesus says, He answered, I tell you, if these were silent, the very stones would cry out. The Pharisees are appalled that people would call Jesus the king, that they would say he's the one come from God. And it is because of this that we read in, in, the, in the following chapter that they begin to plot his death. Their sin is revealed. Jesus reveals all of the group's hearts. The disciples, their heart to worship and follow the king as their master. The crowds, their intrigue and their desire for Jesus to give them what they're looking for. And the Pharisees, their sin, and the fact that they declare Jesus to be someone who he is not. And then we have to ask ourselves, which of these three groups are we most closely aligned with? Dear friends, I, I imagine we'd all hope, at least those of us in King's Church, that we line up with the disciples. And yet I think more often than not, I find in my heart, I line up with the crowd because I want to follow Jesus for what he gives me. Or I line up with the Pharisees. Because instead I find that when I encounter Jesus, what is revealed is my own sin, my own selfishness, my own self-obsession, my self-centeredness is what I instead discover. And actually, particularly right now, Jesus is saying he's up for entering into our hearts like he entered into Jerusalem. Each and every one of us. If you're watching this, you're not part of King's Church, maybe you don't even know Jesus. You've kind of stumbled across this on YouTube or on Facebook. Great. We're so happy to have you. Um, Jesus would like to enter into your heart. It, he'd like to come and meet with you. He would like to be with you. He would like to change you and know you. And friends, we find ourselves living in what I guess we must call apocalyptic days. In the very literal sense, uh, apocalypse means... Um, the revealing or the unveiling. We live in days that reveal what's really going on. Have you noticed how society, we are seeing a stark contrast that people are very selfless, particularly those who serve us in healthcare or those who are setting up volunteer uh, groups or agreeing to volunteer for the NHS or those who are making sure that others on their streets have got food if they're stuck in or if they're busy working long hours. And our selfishness, torn between our selflessness and our selfishness, that others are stockpiling food. Some of that's just fear, but much because they're thinking about themselves before others, making it very hard for anyone else to get anything. That others are putting themselves first, that they feel that they shouldn't have to queue, even though everyone else should have to. That they are not thinking about what puts others first in terms of whether or not they go out, whether or not they choose to do a thing. They're not thinking about others. They're just thinking about themselves. These days are revealing our hearts, just like Jesus does when he comes to us. 
um, Anna Towler, who was just leading worship for us a moment ago, was sharing with a few of us the other night that she felt God had been speaking to her from the start of the life of Solomon in 1 Kings. So Solomon, he's a great king. Um, he's at the early part of his life and God comes to him and says, I will do for you whatever you want. And Solomon thinks about it for a little bit and he says, I would like you to make me wise. And God says, that is a great answer. I really love it. I'm going to make you wise. And also you could have asked for this, 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 and this. I'm going to give you those things as well. And then it appears in the text that Solomon was dreaming. And that's really interesting because it means that Solomon's response to say, I want wisdom was subconscious. This is what Anna was telling us and pointing out to us. Solomon's response was subconscious. And Anna's challenge to a few of us was, what would your response be if Jesus came to you and said, I'll give you whatever you want? What would come out of your heart? What would be revealed? Would it be like Solomon, you're saying, actually, I want things of God. I want, it's not even just, oh, I want more of God. He's very specific. I want wisdom. Would we be able to be specific in how we're going to follow God and our desires? Or would more likely, and this would be my answer, we'd find all sorts of sin and selfishness, me putting myself first, is what would come out. That's a problem, friends. When our hearts are revealed, we find out what we really like. Have you noticed that close confinement leads to us seeing our sin? I've had a week of noticing this, my selfishness and my self-centeredness on display. Perhaps if you're married, you've seen it in how you interact with your husband or your wife. Or if you're blessed to have children, you've noticed that you're finally having your children around all the time, having to homeschool them, frustrating, and it brings out the worst in you. Or perhaps you're, you're a student, you live, or a single person, you're living with housemates, and you're finding your interactions with them are getting increasingly strained. Or you're a student who's gone home and you're living with your parents and that relationship is very, very difficult. None of those things are likely to be primarily problems with the other people. They're problems with our hearts. The difficulties we're finding in our interactions with others are not their fault. They're our fault. I mean, I'm sure there are things that they could do differently. Their sin is also all over the place. But we can deal with our sin. So that's what Jesus wants us to notice. And so I've been finding, as I reflect on it just this last week, that i not coping as well with confinement as I perhaps had originally imagined. I remember sitting down a few days ago and telling Helen, oh, it's great, actually. I'm finding kind of, I'm much less hurried. I'm much less stressed. I'm much calmer. And she kind of turned to me and looked me right in the eye and said, Tim, you're not much less stressed. I should put it a little bit more politely than that. But essentially she began to point out to me, as wives do for husbands and husbands do for wives, several of the ways that, in fact, that was not what um, I was showing. As she put it, Tim, if you're less stressed, could you possibly look like it? I am finding that in some ways, I guess much like it does perhaps when you retire, my world is shrinking to our house and small things are becoming bigger things. And my attention towards them and my concern about them is blown completely out of proportion. I am much less patient than I was a week ago. I am forward in some ways, I am much calmer and my life actually is less hurried, um, though it's much more busy. I am finding I get stressed about things that I should not be getting stressed about, that I have no need to be getting stressed about. What that is, is it's my sin coming out as I get stuck into confinement and as I have the opportunity to see what's really in my heart, which is essentially a desire for control and a desire to uh, have things go my way and complete frustration when things that are not big or not a big deal don't happen exactly as I want them to. Those are not good things. And dear friends, I need to repent and I have begun to. And actually that's the case for all of us, is as we're noticing, and you need to be noticing, the things that are drawn out of our hearts, the sin that Jesus exposes inside of us in this period, that's one of the gifts he's gonna give us amid the, the trial that we find ourselves in. 
And the right response to that gift of knowledge, of sight of your sin, is to repent, dear friends. We've got to repent. That means we've got to say, no, 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 I'm going to turn around. I'm not going to live like that anymore. My entire life is going to change in this area from like this to like this. It's got to change. And actually, when we repent, what we're doing is we're saying, Jesus, I don't want to live like this. Will you come and change me by your spirit and enable me to live differently? Because I promise you, if you do, he will. Because he's the God who enters in. He's the God who steadfastly set his face like flint towards Jerusalem and then entered in towards the day that he knew was coming, towards Friday and towards Sunday. The one who knew that he would come and die for us so that our sin doesn't stick but instead is cast away. And so that we can receive new life like he received new life and walked out of the grave. That's what happens when we repent, but we have to repent. We have to say, yes, that is sin and I want to change and I want to turn around. I need to do something different about it. Jesus, help me. I trust you to do so. We have to then act, but firstly, we have to ask him to help us. And I promise you, he will do so. He will do so. Friends, these are days to repent. Not because we're living in something that's a punishment on particular sins, but because Jesus will give us the gift of showing us where he wants us to change, of showing us where we've fallen short of his standard, of showing us where he wants to make us more like him. And we might be noticing that our global system has been shown to be paper thin. We might be noticing that our control was an illusion and it's been shown that we don't have it. It's been revealed. We might be noticing that our fears, perhaps of death, perhaps of lack of control, perhaps of other things, but that they are being revealed in these days. That's the time in which we live, a time of revealing. And Jesus is about the revealing of our hearts. And so we need to be asking ourselves, as God has put the brakes on, as he has stalled and slowed our lives for all they may well feel very full and very busy they are they are as god has put the brakes on where is he asking to enter in what areas of of sin or difficulty or challenge is he asking to enter into what areas of pain is he asking to enter into What idols is he asking to enter into? What things that we put before him is he asking to enter into? Where does God want to enter into your home? Where does he want to enter into your work, which is now in your home? Where does he want to enter into your study, perhaps, if you're a student? Where does he want to enter into your heart? I promise you there will be many places. On Holy Spirit, we ask that right now you would be revealing to people to all those who are watching this, where you wish to enter into their hearts. Show us our sin. And then please come and deal with it. And we trust that you will. You always, always do. And then Matthew, as he ends his account, says that the whole place was stirred up. That's what happens when Jesus enters in. We'll find that in our hearts, in our lives, in our homes, in our neighborhoods, in our church. When Jesus enters in, the whole place will be stirred up because our hearts are revealed. Will we give him what he asks for? Will we choose to die to our selfishness? Will we choose to follow him? These are the questions he asks us. And he says, if we will, he'll do everything for us. If we will, we get to enter into the rest that comes after Sunday. Now, there's great news coming as this week continues. Great news on Friday. We reflect on his sacrifice for us. Incredible news on Sunday. We see that the world is turned on its head. That everything has changed. Because death now leads to life. Now, I won't steal my thunder for next week. But that's what's coming, dear friends. But right now, Jesus would want to say to us, my dear brothers, my dear sisters, he wants to enter in. What is he asking you to change? What is he asking you to stop? What is he asking you to devote to him instead? Let's use this time that we have well. If we're forced to be unable to meet, which is a great sadness, right? We're beginning to long for one another. I'm fine. I'm in deep grief about not being able to see you. I'm looking forward to seeing many of your faces in our prayer meeting on Wednesday. 
But dear friends, let's dig into Jesus. He wants to change us. I'm going to pray for us. Holy God, we thank you that you love us too much to leave us alone. We thank you that you want us too much to leave us alone. We believe, Jesus, that you came from the heavens to the earth, taking on human flesh and frailty because you wanted us to make yourself low enough to lift us up. We believe that you came firmly and fiercely with the intention of rescuing us, with the intention of having yourself nailed to a beam of wood so that we would not have to bear the justice for the way our hearts are. And you came firmly and fiercely to walk out of the grave so that we could bear and take on new life with you. We thank you, Jesus, that you have entered into our lives to come and get us and change us and rescue us and rest us from our sinful patterns, rest us from our selfishness and instead show us a better way to live. We hope and trust, Holy Spirit, that this week you will begin to show us ways that we can change, ways that we can be more like you. Give us the gift of showing us our sin and then lead us, Holy Spirit, to repent and say, no, 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 that is not who I want to be. I want to be like Jesus. And then come to us, rush to us. We know you will to enable us to do so. Thank you, mighty God. Jesus, 
It's a joy to worship and to hear from God's word on this Palm Sunday. So grateful that Jesus is the King. He's the one we're waiting for. He's the one who has come and will come, the one who's inviting us to go deeper with him. Um, And we're going to have a chance now to join our Zoom groups where we can explore uh, Tim's message a little bit more. We can ask some questions and, uh, and hopefully have some good discussions together. Uh, Just as we finish, I want to encourage you to stay strong. That was God's word to Joshua, Joshua chapter 1, as he led the people of God for the first time. In these kind of unusual days for us, um, God promises to be there, that we don't have to be strong in ourselves. And actually, as we admit our weakness, he is the one who strengthens us. He is the one who comes to us. We have a faithful God who we can trust. So we stay strong, not because, you know, we're powerful, but because he is. So God bless you. May you be strengthened by his spirit. May you know more of his grace and favor over these coming days. Speak soon. God bless you.